essentially what we did is we looked at designing a web page and tried to break that down into a scheme of work across uh, eight lessons. Um, so uh, we should more difficult than we thought it would be. It's more than teachers. So um, a browser, basically we started with the browser in lesson one, we were saying kind of what a browser is and loosely how it works the fact that you take pages and see it. So the second lesson was the breakdown of the page, um, the fact that you can know, view source of page, like try and look at their site as part of the teacher, see whether each one of them can uh, and those identify it so it looks the um, In the third lesson, we then looked at the, maybe an image tag, an A tag, um, after the specific tags in the previous lesson, um, and then kind of seeing the label tags, um, create a basic page of those. CSS is and how content is separate, separate from presentation. Um, in the fifth lesson, then we did some basic CSS rules, uh, and we decided after much debate that they would be color, font size, background color, font family, and margin, um, which we figured would be just enough to make the page have a personality and look a bit different. Um, then in the sixth lesson, we got um, uh, this is to present a web developer task. So the, the kids would, would pose as being a web developer company. Um, they'd give a brief, like they'd create a page for a school or for a rock band or whatever like task would be. Um, and then maybe try and think about how those pages would look and, and what kind of colours and images they should be using. Um, then the seventh lesson, um, they'd be given some last minute content from the client. So it's a bit of real world. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then have to take that content from the brief and plug it into that page. Um, and then the eighth lesson, then we demo that page back into whack and they did it and uh, present it back to the, almost to the client as, as the finished product. Yeah. And we thought that kind of covered the Yeah, and then I guess throughout the year, like, we just keep improving the school website, maybe my tripod. <laughs> <laughs> it's your dolly. Dolly. Yeah. Um, we did, we looked at using robots, we did a simple graphic type breakdown to lesson books that I looked at and the starting point and the end point and then sort of worked out in between. So we said that the start point was they can do scratch, it is a good starting point and then we sort of looked that if they couldn't do that then we'd go back to basics and do basic instructions of getting somebody to walk from one place to switch off the lights and the make the jam sandwich and the typical how to make a cup of tea sort of thing, so we went down there. And then we sort of moved up onto, we sort of encroached onto Turtle up there and we did a bit of basics of Turtle and Python and we also found Guido Van Robot. Which hopefully will be on screen. Which will hopefully be on screen. <laughs> Um, so that was then sort of move up, user value of what to have on the simplified Python language, uh, and then that was move up onto them starting to program into Python, um, how they would get a robot to move around a certain track, um, and there was work on their computers uh, together in pairs, and we did what was called pairing with GT and SEN. Do you all know what GT and SEN is? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. GT is um, effectively. You are gifted and talented, uh, and SEN are special educational needs students. So we worked that we could pair the two together so we could do peer programming, and so you'd have sort of one gifted and talented and one SEN for their students together. Um, we also mentioned um, a competitive edge to it, uh, Micro Mouse. Uh, so that's um, basically competitions that they sort of kind of local, national, international, where there are robots, mazes. that sort of aspect as well um, and then it was obviously the transition of then into Python and then from Python using the Raspberry Pi onto a robot of some sort and how it sort of <coughs> or follow the lighter or something along 
along those lines. And then in the most all of those, there's loads lo of the key things of input process and output, feed for us, feedback, uh, looping, conditional variables, simulation, following statements, um, understand the order of things and happening functions and things like that. Um, we had an extension task, so if they got to this point faster, then they could add more advanced behaviors to the robot and things like that. So we sort of worked at the bottom. Starting off with, so we start off with a remind everyone what's going on thing, which is a scene setting, which is where we give people a, um, a, a known size box uh, to get around. So if they have to sort of drive the turtle up there, then move around it in uh, half a square and, and, and get on. That uses their basic techniques and, and they can do that. Then we start talking about well, what happens if you change the size of the box um, and um, how do you know where it is. So we have to introduce some kind of um, uh, obstruction um, facility within it. We're assuming we have a blind turtle, so the turtle can't see anything, but we're going to give it the ability to um, detect when it's hit something within the environment. Now we decided that, that was something we didn't want to do, uh, get the, the kids to be involved in, so we're going to have to provide them with the first step, which is defining objects and defining how you detect that you've actually hit something. Um, but there is then a simple uh, or routine that people can, can make use of, which is effectively hold your hand out, and if you bump into something, then don't go into that particular place, which is a little loop saying, move forward, um, oh dear, I bumped into something, move backwards, and then you can make use of that logic and follow through. So once you've got that logic in your head, you can then begin to look at more complicated mazes, you can turn them around um, and say, does it make any difference if, if indentation is on the side that you're avoiding um, and this can be gradually built up into following proper mazes um, and getting around those things and the competitive element of this is that you can have groups inventing mazes and passing them to other groups and saying get out of that then um, and maybe you can also time people and say how quickly do they get out of the maze and so on and so forth we didn't get around to um, working this out as a timed plan because we weren't quite sure how the difficulty of some of these tasks would play out within a uh, classroom environment. So really we're going up to something which is potentially quite um, extensive 
although the actual, there is a generalized maze following algorithm, which is actually only a few lines of code. Um, it was invented by a 12 year old some years ago. Um, but it does not mean to say that every 12 year old is equally capable of inventing this algorithm. So we're not expecting people to come up with this generalized maze following algorithm, but we're actually expecting people to be able to come up with something which makes a reasonable fist of getting out of a maze. Um, and that um, shouldn't be beyond, um, uh, beyond a general ability. Um, but again, we, we didn't do the diversity thing either, so we, we, we missed out on that. I think we got bogged down on a lot of the details about how much of this is actually presented to the classroom as a face company, and how much of this are we expecting the class to actually work out for themselves and, and do, which is why we took out the object handling um, as a separate thing, and we're going to give that to the class because working out to do collision detection is actually a different problem to solving a maze problem. So that's as far as we've got. Thank you very much. So, um, I don't know if we, uh, uh, to be approaching the divide and conquer type strategy, uh, we've fractioned into three different groups to try and um, <coughs> um, to work out kind of what, which final product we thought would be feasible in the time scale that we were given. Um, one approach we went down was uh, importing a PNG file and trying to animate a character around the screen. Uh, the other was this uh, tic tac toe project. Which I didn't think we'd be able to achieve, but we started kind of picking apart. Well, maybe we don't need to explain arrays. Maybe we can do it by repeating simple kind of instructions and just that repetition. So we give them some and expect them to complete the rest. Um, I think uh, I, I wrote down the whole uh, compulsory IT classes have a mixed ability. So we want to make sure that by the end, I can say that all the pupils can do some basic tasks. So each kind of um, project that we're working on, including variables, conditionals and loops. Um, and then I think we got bogged down then into the reading the keystrokes and found some problems kind of working out the event handling. But do you want to talk through the tic tac -tel? Yeah, so the idea was to, was to just try to put together a really, really simple game using the smallest number of language features you can get away with. So there's no array handling, um, <coughs> there's no control variables, there's a single loop, um, layer one, reads in the player's move, simple mechanism of checking whether or not you know, what the, the move goes, variable names that make it nice and easy and obvious um, how it's done. Uh, and just below here, the whole thing just repeated once for the X player and then once for the uh, for the other player. Um, and that's it. And it's a, a playable game that is written in 35 lines and uses a really small number of language features without any so our thoughts were that, uh, like, how many lessons would it take to achieve that, and uh, how much would you have to force feed them and uh, kind of give them in advance? Uh, so the second tactic we tried was, well, if we're going to start giving them things, we can make the graphics look better, and then we can personalise it a little more. Then we got cards up here in the event handling. So um, this was like my concept for lesson one, um, where you get some stuff that is given to you. Um, I have drawn a rabbit graphic, but uh, the my my idea was that you can have the students choose like a graphic from Google Images or something. So you can choose a monkey or a, so that's not provided. You download the graphic, draw it onto the screen, and then lesson one, you, uh, you get that. <laughs> you get that. So uh, from, first, well, from first principle, and there's, there's uh, a bit of border paint there, but the, the loop, there are bits in there that you can explain uh, that you're up here, you're defining a color, you're loading an image, those things are then available, and then we're redrawing the screen many times and drawing those things onto it. Um, and 
then we were considering where to go from there. Uh, and uh, so the next thing is to take what we've done in lesson one there and just put in this block of code uh, where you can see the block of code. That, that lump. Uh, so there is a there's one line of boilerplate and then get into uh, so in lesson one we had a variable changing is plugged into the, the, the game and that makes animation happen. And then what we've done here is connected input to a variable and then that makes the game controllable. So, uh, so now I can move the rabbit around the keys. Um, and then we were thinking from going from there, uh, doing things like um, collecting carrots. Uh, or maybe to avoid having to introduce arrays, there is one carrot on the screen at any one point and you have to move the rabbit to, to the carrot. Uh, yeah, that's text-based adventure game yesterday in the code dungeon. So I rushed off and, and grabbed it, um, thinking this would be a great starting point. Um, but it soon became obvious, and this is an important point, that what I think is a lovely, simple adventure game sort of made out and sort of went, ah, they can't teach that because it's just complicated or that there's so many kind of things that you can't really explain to a group of 14-year-olds, which is the target audience that we've chosen to do. So, um, so what we did is we took a, a starting point, which is probably the simplest adventure game you could possibly get. Um, and it basically brings out a whole bunch of things with uh, a, a occasional... Is this the one that Adam had? Yes, yes. Okay. So two, two second pauses, you know, as it says here, is just there to build up the suspense. So this, this, <laughs> this is something that these children who are in year nine, they're 14 now, this isn't too much of a departure from what they've done in a previous year. Yeah. So there's a bit of a, let's go back just a little bit to where we were last time we looked at this kind of thing. <coughs> so they, yeah, so what we were expecting them to start, the starting point was that they've done a sort of a calculator in, in pipe, basically. So they've taken input, what, um, they've checked it, and they've done some calculations. And what we've been doing are things like print yeah. and if, so they know print and if is basically where we're starting from. And so basically, the game is, which way do you want to go? If you answer R, you fall down a trapdoor and you're dead. <laughs> if you answer anything else, um, <laughs> which would be quite funny, uh, you see a beautiful variety of art, etc, etc, etc. And then what we did, we, um, we tried to work out how we could move from this as a given starting point and introduce the various concepts we found that people would need to create an adventure game and allow the children to work in groups and take this and start to modify it and just move on and uh, so the next week they move on a bit further so that by the end of the six or eight weeks, however long it is, if you've got five groups in the class, you've got five different adventure games that each started from the original seed. Um, and, we, uh, and we started to... Um, is it uh, and we started to document it. There's a great thing that happens sometimes when. Yeah. So, yeah. When you have a group that are say, building a text based adventure game in the class, they say, oh, could we put in, like, there's like a lamp in a room and you pick up the lamp, how would we do that? 
it's great when the children say, can you show us how to do that bit? Oh, well, I can show you something that will help. Rather than me say, right, today you're all going to learn how to put a lamp in a room. Well, yeah. we don't want to put a lamp in ours, so why should we? Yeah. So when they're motivated and they then say, or could we add in, like, uh, you could have, like, health, and every time you go so, 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 so far, you lose a health point for yeah. some time, and then you're dead. It's got to find food. To yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we talked a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and argued a lot. I argued a lot. And agreed a little. Yeah. <laughs> I saw came in a slightly different approach, because I'm not a, not a teacher, despite working there at the university, <laughs> and got a technical role. And I sort of, the view I said was, as a programmer, what do I provide? And yes, a knowledge of Python, but the, I think that the writing of the sample programs came to me as being a really important thing. And we, I sort of came to a view, and I think it's agreed by other people, is that you need good sample programs, which are hard work to write, and for each program, you need to be able to list the skills required to understand the program, to maintain the program, and to develop a program like that from scratch. So each program, it might be 20 or 30 lines, or even less, has got certain uh, pedagogic requirements or outcomes in terms of if the first student can understand that program, they know something. And from my point of view, the, the um, the lesson plan was the students could understand this program at the beginning, and at the end they could understand and write this sort of program. So it's a question of having um, a large number of programs that represent the students' progress. To achieve that, we talked about actually giving them a, a basic but complete solution that yeah. they could then change and hack. Yeah. They look, when, you, when you talk about, mm -hmm. we're going to hack something, they like the idea of the principle. It sounds cool. Yeah, it sounds like... Oh, I'm going to get to hack something. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually done JavaScript training. I tell a lot. I've done it in Python courses as well. And the way I do that in an afternoon is I teach them all sorts of basic stuff. And then I say, here's a whole application that works. You've got to add some features to it. So I teach them all the bits and pieces. And then I give them a whole program and they understand all the bits and pieces of it individually. And they've got to add something. Or you could give them a broken one and then try and get them to fix it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I do that too. I give them a failing test that they have to fix. Yes. But sometimes you do it deliberately. Yeah. Sometimes you do it deliberately with a broken one yeah. rather than accidentally giving them a broken one. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I've created a GitHub repository. Um, which is here. So, um, With URL at the top, then told 500 UK education screen. I've already had somebody uh, ping me a ping request, uh, a pull request. And um, what I'd like to do is try and gather all the things. Uh, if you put stuff on a piece of paper, please try and write it up in digital form. Clone the repository, stick it in a, a directory for your project, and give me a pull request so I can get all this stuff pulled together. Um, I think also it might be useful if you're interested in what we were doing today. Um, swap emails or Twitter handles or whatever and see if you can keep some events going if you've got a bit of planning. Um, but uh, I think that's, that's... One of the messages as well from what we teachers think you geeks need to know is we don't all know about GitHubs and Git repositories and <laughs> all that kind of thing. Yeah? So don't assume we know. And don't, don't mock us for not knowing. And you didn't put it on We're the list. Yeah. 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 I don't think any of the developers mock teachers for not knowing something. If that's happening, then that's a serious failure on the developer's part. I think, from my perspective, there's so much assumption that's made because I do this every day, it's kind of in my muscle memory, that I'm just, and I talk, well, all the people I meet know what GitHub is, that's a sad sort of life I lead. I don't know that recently, I was Yeah, so, you know. I think the, 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 the critical thing is Think that anybody else might do that easily. Yeah. Oh, you just go, you know, you can find out, it's going to take you half an hour to find it, just type it into Google. Yeah, that works. I think you're better. That's a, a mindset, a way of doing things. As a developer, you have to strike a balance between patronizing people and uh, blinding them with science. Well, so yeah, you don't, 
you don't want to just explain everything to somebody because they'll just think you're a jerk. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, it's one o'clock, and it's going to be time for us, but before we go, um, 